I just wanted to go over what to expect from distributors. I guess I call these distributor discounts. Um, the first one is a depletion allowance, and I just want to explain these in case any of you don't know uh, what these terms are. Depletion allowance is used to discount to a specific quantity sale, like a five-case deal or a specific class of trade, like restaurants. Now, in New York, you can't sell to a restaurant for a different price than you sell to a retailer. But in, for instance, Texas, I believe you can. I think it's anything goes. You can sell to any customer for whatever price you want. Uh, we have to file a price, and we can't have a different price. But a depletion allowance might be your FOB is $100 a case, but for anybody who's going to buy five cases, you'll tell your distributor, I'll give you a $5 depletion allowance, and you pass that on to the customer in price, and that, that way, that helps me generate some volume, because I know for every five case deal, I'm getting $5 a case less, but I know I'm getting more five case deals. So you pat the, you, as a winery, you would ask for an accounting at the end of each month, and all the five case deals, you would then give the distributor a credit of $5 or whatever the number was, it might be $8. Um, for all those cases. And this way, all the cases that are sold, one, two, three, and four cases, you get your full FOB. But the five case deal, you, take, you get a lesser FOB, effectively, without having to change the FOB on all the bills going out of the winery. Qu question? Yeah? Oh, okay. Well, they do. Right. They don't, they don't in Connecticut either, but the, this, is, this is all the big states, the important ones. Just kidding. Just kidding. An SPA is a special price allowance. Usually that's used by wineries to accelerate, the, like when you're having a sale. Your, your FOB is normally $100, but you've got 500 cases of 2011 Pinot Gris. Yikes, I hope nobody does. And you want to move it out. So you'll say, OK, my FOB is $100, but I've, uh, you can buy all this 2011 Pinot Gris for $72. Okay, so that's a special price allowance. And then a floor stock adjustment, you'll hear about this occasionally. This is when you've given an SPA, you go to the distributor, you say, OK, starting July, all the 2011 Pinot Gris is now 72 bucks a case. And the distributor says, hey, but wait, I got 32 cases on my floor. So, OK, we'll give you a floor stock adjustment on Ju July 1st. You send me your inventory. I'll send you a discount of $28 a case for everything you have on your floor. Okay. These, I don't know, I may be talking to, you may all know these terms already, but these are, these are some things you should know as you start dealing with distributors. By the way, can anybody tell me as an overall strategy, why, we, why would you use these discounts instead of simply lowering your FOB? Anybody? What? The national retail price. National retail price would change? Yes? Okay, you don't want to lower the price because you don't want to come back up. That's that's one reason. Yes, you don't. Yeah, you don't want to lower your your FOB price because then you have trouble going back to the old FOB. That's a good reason. Anybody else? Accounting. Accounting. You must be an accountant. Or, <laughs> were you? Were you? Marketing within accounting. Yes. Yeah. One of the biggest reasons is, and this is what accountant an accountant will tell you, is that if your FOB is a hundred bucks a case, and you have a thousand cases in your warehouse in stock, you have $100,000 of inventory. And if you're, if you're borrowing money from a bank, which I know none of you are, um, they're going to look at that as an asset. And if you all of a sudden knock your FOB down, you've just lowered the value of your asset. So by keeping it at, at that price and offering a discount, these are marketing costs. So accounting-wise, it's smarter to do it this way. Accounting-wise, it's smarter to keep your FOB where it is, use, use discounts, because that, that comes off in a different part of the balance sheet. I'm not an accountant, but I know that's, that's what they'll tell you. Yes? Are these typically done by billbacks, or what's the typical way of, of exchanging the money? It can be done by billback, but usually, um, yes. For a depletion, the question is, are these done by billbacks to the winery? Depletion allowances are usually billbacks to the winery, and they're usually issued in the form of a credit so that the next time you send them a bill, 
the distributor will just take a credit. So you're really not sending checks back and forth. You don't want to get into doing that. That, that, that becomes more complicated. Um, an SPA, generally you're selling the wine at a lower price. You're giving them a discount right on your own invoice. And the floor stock is, again, done as a bill back. You would bill back the winery. The distributor would bill back the winery for whatever cases he had on the floor at the time the price dropped. Yes? Rips? No, bit. I can't. <laughs> Number one, they're in New Jersey. I do sell in New Jersey, but our company does not participate in rips. I can talk about them. I'm sorry. I do, are rips done anywhere else but New Jersey? The question is, what's a rip? It's a retailer incentive program. It's insane. It's the state. Uh, the, the state of New Jersey um, approved this about 15 years ago. It's basically you sell. One of the, the only good thing about this is when the wholesaler sells to the retailer, he sells the wine, for instance, at $100 a case. And the retailer can't sell the wine, can't advertise or sell the wine below, below his cost. But then what you, the wholesaler does is gives the retailer a discount in the form of a check after the fact. So instead of a $100 case that's discounted to 80 when you buy 10, it's $100 a case and you get a $20 per case RIP, Retailer Incentive Program. It's given back to the store. So it's, it's the same discount, but instead of just the retailer paying you $80, he pays you 100, you take that 100, you give him back 20. It's insane, except, it, it's insane, well, I'll tell you what, some of the, there's, there's a lot of room for abuse here, but um, the one thing it does do is it protects the winery's suggested retail price. Because I've had wineries who said, especially in New Jersey, I'm going to raise my price and give a rip back so that, that no matter what a store buys, uh, wants to do, they can't sell it below my, manu my nationally suggested retail price. And then we'll, you pay them back in the form of a discount. Now, where do those checks go? Who are they made out to? Who's take, who's what, who's, who's filing this stuff with the IRS? It's all, they used to do it in American Express gift checks. I had, I had, an, I had a marketing assistant who had, who had sometimes twenty dollars or $30,000 worth of Amex gift checks in a locked drawer that all had to be made out to retailers all around, and mailed all around the state. And you know, what, just lose one of those and see what happens. It creates a nightmare. And then you get somebody who says, I didn't actually get it. Then we had to start sending them FedEx with a signature. For every one, it became crazy. So when I started, the, comp the new company I started, we said, there's, there's no way we're doing rips. There's just no way. It's, it, we just tell people the price is the price, that's it. Yes, in the back. Yes. Samples. The question is about samples. What's the average? I actually have that in a slide later, but we've, we've calculated, I mean, I've looked at it every which way to Sunday. About 2% is what it, what it comes out to. And um, there are better ways than doing billbacks to do that. But we'll talk about that in a minute. Because I've got some more, oh, we're going to get deeper into distributors and, did I cover everything? Yeah, distributors and what to do. So, hang on, losing my voice here. You all can hear me in the back, correct? This mic is picking up. Okay. Managing priorities and expectations for you and, well, for you mostly. This is, take a look at this because this is a really important um, section of the program. So distributors exist to distribute your wine. That's what they should do best. They should take your wine in pallet quantities and bring it to their home state and make sure it gets to lots of customers around the state. That's what they should do. So selling 100 cases of your wine to 50 customers is not the same as selling 100 cases of your wine to three customers. You have a right to expect that. The word distributor has some meaning. Okay? 
if, if you don't care, that's fine. If you don't care where it goes, that's okay too. And I will tell you that I don't, if I were doing this, if I were having this conversation anywhere in Europe, they wouldn't, they don't care. They don't ever ask where we sell their wine. They're just happy they got paid. They're very happy they got paid. But it's much more important, it's always been much more important to our domestic winery partners. And that's okay. You guys have a much, you have a much bigger interest in those particular markets. All right. A distributor should excel at customer service, warehouse, and delivery. Three most important things they should do. If they can't, ex and I, when I say excel, I don't mean just do that. They have to be good at it. Okay? Uh, I mean, restaurants and retailers should want to do business with that distributor. They should have good things to say about the service. If they don't, then the distributor's not doing a good job. They're not excelling at customer service. Distributors should take obstacles out of the way of the sales process. I emphasize this all the time. I emphasize this with my customer service people and I emphasize it with my sales people and my managers. Your, object, your, your job is to take obstacles out of the way of the sales process. You don't need obstacles in, a, in the way of a sales process. It's hard enough to sell things, especially wine. You don't need to throw obstacles in the way. And so what kind of obstacles would I be talking about? Okay, abbreviated customer service hours. Okay, the, the, the customers can't get through because it, the order board closes at 3.30. Well, 3.30, restaurants are still ordering wine, okay? Delivery, uh, abbreviated delivery hours or schedules. Inability to get a live person on the phone. Oh, that's a big, that really pisses off customers. Poorly stored wine. This is something to consider. Where is your wine being stored? It should be... At this quality level of everyone in this room, it should be in a refrigerated warehouse. End of story. Anybody that's not storing your wine in a refrigerated warehouse, you shouldn't be doing business with them. In this day and age, you shouldn't. Rude delivery staff. Rigid return policies. Okay, these are all, these are all peeves, pet peeves of mine that I, 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 I absolutely don't want to have. Inability to get samples or information. Unresponsive sales management or staff, you know, the customer's got a problem, calls the salesman, leaves a message, doesn't get back to him, calls his manager, the manager calls back, doesn't have an answer, says I'll take care of it, doesn't take care of it. Those are all obstacles that you don't need in the, in, in the middle of this process. This is probably the most, the next, next line is probably the most important one in this whole presentation. Distributors don't make the market for your brand. They service the market for your brand. Okay, don't expect miracles. If you give a distributor a good quality wine in a good package at a good price, they should do a good job for you. But they can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. Okay, so you can't expect that. They're not going to solve problems for you if the problems exist at the winery or at the, at the product level. But if you give them all the right things, they should do a good job for you. That's their job. They should excel at customer service, warehouse, and delivery. Now, above and beyond that, I can tell you that there are a lot of distributors that go above and beyond that. I've always done that in my career. But don't expect it. All right? The, the, you have to manage your expectations of what a distributor can and will do. Yes. Can we talk about the extra last bullet? They don't make the market. They don't make the market. Yeah, they don't make the market for you. They don't, they, they don't make your brand. You have to make your brand image. You have to make, you have to make, I mean, you, you make what your brand image is. You develop the message. The, the, the distributor can relay that message and service the market. In other words, bring your product to market. They should be out sampling it. If you've put a good bottle of wine in a good package at a good price, they will service that market. But they can't make, like I said, they can't make a silk purse out of a sow's ear. And that, that was the essence of that, that next to the last line. Yes? So you're suggesting that the supplier, when you say don't make the market, the supplier should be there in person making the market. No, no. I mean, when you say, I say make the market, it's your image. 
It's the fact that you've done the hard work of making good wine, of, of putting it in a good package, of giving it out to national press, of um, doing a little bit of public relations. I'm not suggesting any of you in here hire a PR company, but certainly you know how to do your own PR to a certain extent. You're the best ambassadors for your brand that there is. And so, yes, to a certain extent, being out there and being the face of the winery, that's important. That's making your market. Yes, Michael? Following up on that, do you, do you turn down brands that uh, are totally unknown or just starting out? Do you turn, brand, turn down brands that are totally unknown or just starting out? Um, yes, that can happen, but very often you want to be the one who finds the next big thing. And so distributors are always, myself included, looking for something that, wow, this is, this is nobody's ever heard of this, but it's really great. It's really terrific. That's not a reason in and of itself to turn something down. If it's one of a hundred other like things that are just like it, if it's another, you know, Kendall Jackson Price Chardonnay and a Kendall Jackson kind of package, and I don't want to denigrate Kendall Jackson, they do a great job of what they do, but, um, and it's totally unknown, as a distributor I might say, well, you know, how am I ever going to overcome the, the vast marketing resources and the, and the history of Kendall Jackson by selling this wine that's almost identical but nobody's ever heard of it. Generally, you've got things, and I'm sure all of you in this room, have things in the bottle that are unique and that you can you find selling points for. Okay. Yes, in the back. Uh, yeah, your second to last statement, is that the same as saying that you can't expect them to do any brand building and that brand building is all on the winery? No, that's not what I'm saying. Well, at the very, at the very minimum, yes. But a good distributor will do some of that for you. You have to bring the message to them. In other words, when you come personally and do a sales meeting and you give them your brand image, you tell them what you represent, you tell them, you get them enthusiastic about the wine, they'll go out and promote that. And as a good distributor, like I said, good distributors will go above and beyond that, but it's not necessarily their job to make great brands out of your wine. You've got to make the, you've got to make the brand. You've got to make the image. Market and gaining points of distribution, where you're actually seeing brand strength. Yeah, I'm saying no. They should be getting distribution. Yeah. That's what they should be doing. If they're not taking it out and they're not servicing the market with what you've given them, um, I mean, it's just like making wine. If if the vineyard doesn't give you really good grapes, you, the winemaker isn't gonna isn't gonna make great wine out of that. You can't make a silk purse out of a sow. It's the same. Think of it as good grapes into the winery good wine into the distribution channels. Yes, Ellen? Another way to look at that to make the market is the winery constantly pulls out the new marketplace mm. in terms of the brand authenticity, the story, the yeah. uniqueness, the specialness, and anything we can do to raise the level of awareness of a brand nationally will help the sales process mm -hmm. pull through. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a question of creating pull while you're pushing it out to individual customers in your market. Thank you. I don't know. Did, you, did, did everyone hear that? Um, it, it, can you say that again? <laughs> I, I don't know if I can repeat everything. And maybe I should get, hand you a mic. Here. No? You don't want the mic? It's basically what Ellen's saying is that anything that you can do as a winery to generate um, pull for your brand, whether that even if that's as simple as putting good wine in the bottle and having a good story to sell to tell. It's not necessarily hiring a big PR firm to go out and get your name in, you know, uh, in, in wine magazines or Bon Appetit. But anything that you can do to create pull while the distributor is pushing the wine into retail and, and restaurants um, is making the market for your brand, and that's what's important that you do. Yes. I don't know of any. I, I mean, I don't know. I don't know. That would be a Nielsen. Uh, Nielsen would probably give you that information if you subscribe to it. They probably, I'm sure they have Nielsen numbers by state, but there's no chain stores in New York, and I don't know how much Nielsen data there is. You've just been dealing with Nielsen. 
Uh, Tom, do you know? have something called Liquor Scan that paid liquor store owners and fine wine shop and package store owners for that. There is some kind of a derivative of that that now exists that's different than their grocery store scanner. I can talk to you after, but they have something. It's not free, but they could probably come up with a report that we could probably get our hands on. Yes. Let me just poke at that for a second. Wait. What would you do with that? I'm not going to be a wise guy, but what would you do with that? Well, I, I think I think you know if if you are somebody who's small and you and you like have this great distributor someplace that's you know in you know Maine or Massachusetts and you go oh my God you know I send them you know three fourths of my PO production so, for perspective so then context. you then you then you what you do you turn around and you, and you go to the next you go to, to another another region you go you know I'm the number one Pinot in Boston. Yeah, so my, my sales bit, in Boston bit, are, are phenomenal. Yeah, surely, context. you know, yeah, I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a way of creating pull. You know, hi, I'm the number one Pinot in Boston. I think you're right. I think you're getting at something that we learned a little bit the hard way at San Michelle. Maybe there's other experiences here. That's almost like telling a baseball manager, hey, I want a certain number of runs at the end of the game. Rather than saying, I want to focus now on signals and doubles and stolen bases, the executional tactics that lead up to that, long-winded way of saying, maybe a way to skin the cat for some markets is to say, hey, I want to be in these 25 accounts. What's it going to take me to be in these great restaurants as a way of, of getting at the volume objective you're no, after? It, it, it's a way of saying, hi, I, I'm batting 340 right now. Don't you want me on your team? <laughs> right. I get it. OK, it was, yes. That's communication from. That yeah. What makes her Pino better than her Pino? There's, you know, you got to convey that story so when the sales rep can get it out to the retailer and so forth. Yeah, what you're saying is communication from the winery to the retailer, having a good website. Those are all things that I have that you should expect. Distributors should expect from the winery. Winery should expect from the distributor. We'll actually, we'll actually go over that. Yes, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, wait, you. I'm sorry, you had your hand up first, but I didn't know if you were going to. I'm going to hand these around because. Sure. Yeah, I was. Go ahead, talking. I'm not sure if it's on. It is on. Yeah. Uh, so I was just going to say a different perspective as far as knowing you know, who's number one in a certain state. Rather than having to reinvent the wheel, by knowing that, you can you know, take a lead and use someone as an example and say, well, how is this winery that's had really great success in New York or wherever, how, what are they doing to have that success? And for those of us who don't have a lot of marketing money to throw at a PR firm or mm -hmm. you know, something like that, we can actually learn from someone who's already doing it. Oh, that's, that's, that's a very good point. And learning from other wineries, learning through your distributors what other wineries are doing. And uh, don't, don't take this, my statements here, to take all the burden off of the distributor for not doing anything. I just want to point out where the various responsibilities for the brand lie and the success of the brand lie. And the fact is, good distributors will do those things. They will find ways to market and sell your wine above and beyond the tools that you've given. And those are what make the excellent distributors around the country, the ones that really get recognized and do really well. Did you still have? Here. Well, there it is. So making the market for a brand is obviously a continual process. And one of the things that I <clears throat> wonder is what are some of the best practices or what of suppliers that work with you, what are some examples of doing things well to communicate with you and your reps about what's happening with the brand? Okay. Um, you all heard that question. What, what are some of the best practices? 
distributors, I mean, uh, wineries that either show up in the market with regularity or send someone to show up in the market with some regularity are very important because it's, as Tom was saying, part of the process is simply getting in front of a sales staff, getting in front of a customer. Uh, you do that repeatedly over and over. It's like at bats, you will eventually get hits. Um, having a, a good website, having a website that a salesman knows he can go to your website, download a PDF, sell sheet, and have it with him when he goes out to make the presentation. Um, wineries that have sales reps have um, either marketing reps or someone from the winery that goes to the market and actually makes things happen, a rainmaker, with customers in that market, or sells to national account. That's, that's for if you, if you get a sale to a national account, that helps all your distributors around the country who have those national accounts in their, in their territories. Um, winning over the sales staff. I have to tell you, as, as a winery owner or a representative of the winery, when you're in the market or you're in front of a sales meeting, winning over those sales reps is really important. Because if they don't like you, they just forget about you. And there's no reason for, for, for salespeople not to like you. And they're not deliberately combative. Salespeople generally are very friendly, want, want approval, and want, that's, part of their, that's part of what drives them, the need for approval and other things. But that's the psychology of sales. That's another class. Um, but there are certain wineries that salespeople will do things for and go out of their way for that they don't for others because of the relationship they have either with the image of the winery or at the actual people of the, at the winery. And so that's important. Little things. I mean, I had a winery that used to send all my salespeople every year, they would make a wreath out of grapevine cuttings. I mean, I don't think it cost them anything. But they would send them, uh, you know, for Christmas. It wasn't expensive, but it was a nice touch. I, one of my wineries here sends me, uh, sends everybody a bag of um, hazelnuts or walnuts. I can't remember. Yeah, what? Yeah, you do that. So I mean, it's, it can be little things like that. I mean, that really is, is many steps away from the sales process. But, um, but the, the things you, you know, the things we mentioned before, especially the website in this day and age, is really important. Okay. Yes. Yes, yes and no. It depends on who you are. The question is, what is frequent uh, when visiting a market? If you're the proprietor and the, 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 the uh, vineyard worker and the winemaker and the sales and marketing guy, you're doing all this at once, I don't expect you in the market more than once or twice a year. I'd like to have you more, but I know the realities. Um, we'd like to have someone from a winery in the market two to three to four times a year. Generally, the bigger the winery, the more times you need to come. I mean, that's really what it is. It's really what it comes down to. Yes? Are our treatment plans to be different when we're huh. on the road? We average uh, two market visits per geography per year. Mm -hmm. um, the other side of the story is we are riding with people who have had person after person after person in their car. Mm -hmm. They are inundated with customer visits, mm -hmm. and they are done. And their customers, restaurateurs and retailers, are also tired of seeing suppliers. You're exactly you right. You've been to New York, I can see. <laughs> now, the, I mean, the, the question about our, our, our visits from wineries and, wi and supplier rep visits getting to be overwhelming, both for salespeople and for their customers. Yes, it's happening in our market. I see it all the time. There are more and more, there are more distributors than there ever were now. There are more winery reps than there ever were showing up in the market. We limit our salespeople to three work with a month, okay? Be just so this doesn't happen. And eventually, it, it, it winds up, they wind up doing four. One a week is a lot, but two to three a month. So, and then their customers are also saying, I've got winery rep after winery rep parading through my door, I don't have time to see them all. This is a market-wide problem that's not, I don't see how it's necessarily solvable. And one of the, 
one of the reasons is you all, and when I say you all, wineries of all types, from importers to California to Oregon, are actually doing a better job of getting out there. But what you're doing is you're saturating a market to the point where, and especially in places like New York City, where um, restaurateurs and retailers are throwing their hands up and saying, I don't have any more time. Now, what I can recommend to you is I tell winery reps all the time, go to upstate New York. They'll welcome you with open arms because they never see anybody. They just don't see. Go to Buffalo, Rochester, Syracuse, Ithaca, Albany. Those are actually good markets. They would be a major city in most of the other 48 states other than California or New York. But they don't get, they don't see people. So perhaps going to New York City is not, or going to uh, Orlando, Florida is not the right thing to do. Go to a different market in that state. You'll probably, you'll get a better reception. You'll have more time, more quality time with both the sales rep and the customer. Sometimes you just have to say, okay, hands off, we'll see what happens in, in, in the big markets. But you know what? Everybody in the world wants to be in New York. Every winery in the world, the first place they come to, and don't forget, there's a whole world outside of the, the, the two coasts that wants to sell wine, and that's the first place they come to. There's something like 35,000 wines listed on 750, which is a winery wholesale to retail B2B um, uh, listing service. 35,000 or 37,000 wines. That's, that's crazy. All right, let's, yes. Who had a bad ride with experience in communicating back to the management of the distributor? Like Com not commu no. enough accounts. Communicate, or? absolutely. Tell the, man the manager, wants, the manager should want to hear that. You don't want to throw somebody under the bus. Um, it might be better done in person or on the phone rather than in, than in an email. Um, you should be clear because you don't want to alienate that salesperson. You want to make friends out of all the salespeople, but you should absolutely not pull any punches and say, look, this is what happened. You may have had a bad day. I want you to know. But my time when I'm, when I'm here from Oregon and wherever here was, you're, you're spending money and you have a right to expect that your time is wisely used. Again, we, we go over that. Yes, one more. Before I move on. What's the difference if the winemaker shows up versus a sales rep? It does in the consumer market, does it in the yes. retail market? Yes, it does. It does, I'll be perfectly frank with you. If I call up Sherry Lehman and say, I've got the winemaker here, or I say I've got their director of marketing, I get a very different response. I, you see that yourselves, I'm sure you do. All right, what should a winery expect from a distributor? Anything? Here's that word payment on time again. Okay, take a look at this. Payment on time with a reasonable grace period. Accurate monthly reporting. <clears throat> How many of you get no reporting back from your, your distributors except for, except for inventory and depletion? Everybody must send you an inventory and depletion. So you, so there are some people that don't even get an inventory or depletion report? You have a, distri you have a distributor? And they don't send you an inventory or depletion report. Anything else? Okay, I want to hear horror stories. Come on. <laughs> Somebody, where's the microphones? Where's the microphone? So who's got a horror story about not getting information from their distributor? You do? Where's, can you pass the mic? I'm not going to name the distributor, but I oh, okay. our, our accounts up on our website. Wait, is that on? Uh, the, look in the screen. <laughs> really? The distributor does not want to give the winery their account list because they think you're going to share it with another distributor. <coughs> Point out to him that if any other distributor worth their salt doesn't know who those customers are, then they shouldn't be a distributor. You can find all 10,000 licensees on the state, New York State Liquor Board website, so anybody can find out that information. That is such a lame excuse. Oh my God! Yes, no, I'm. I'm not blaming you. What a lame excuse! Oh my God! Yeah. Okay. You should be getting at minimum. You should be getting depletion reports, 
you should be able to get an on and off premise report breakdown. You should get a year on year tracking. In other words, how much did I sell of each varietal this year versus last year? And you should be getting it by sales rep. Or they should be subscribing to Beverage Data Network, uh, which is a third party affiliate, although that costs you money. And, and not ne that not, isn't necessarily what you want. A good distributor should be able to give you this information and more. I'm sorry, you were pointing. Oh, you have a question. Yeah, I, I was working with a distributor. This was a long time ago. We had a broker in Texas. I couldn't get a phone call from the distributor back, but I also couldn't get an inventory or depletion. And my broker out there actually had to go in physically and count the bottles to give me an accurate inventory of what we had. Fire that distributor. <laughs> yeah, we, you know. The company I started five years ago, Verity Wine Partners, we give our suppliers the access code to our operating system, to our operating system. I have had actually an Oregon winery, <laughs> that, which means they can see everything, every single thing about their product that's going on in our system, including a PO that we've put in, including the receivables or our payables to the winery, and if we're overdue, they can see real-time inventory. I had an Oregon winery call me up, no, send an email to one of my distributor, one of my salespeople, and said, wow, Deborah, great placement at so-and-so restaurant. I got a phone call like five minutes later from her. She's gone, oh my god, I just made that, I just made that sale about an hour ago. How did he know about this? So he has access to our thing. I guess he doesn't have anything else to do. He's looking at our depletion. <laughs> He's looking at our sales orders as they're going out. She was freaked out. But I mean, she couldn't figure out how did he know. But that's the level of access we give to our suppliers. And there's no reason in this day and age with the kind of uh, technology we have that you can't, that, that all that, inf I mean, you might have been able to have the excuse years ago, oh, we can't print all that stuff up. We can't gather all that data. All the data is there. All the data is there. I guarantee the owners of the company have all that data at their fingertips. There's no reason they shouldn't share it with you, and there's no reason you should deal with distributors who are not transparent like that. All right. Ex um. By the way, just a note on payment on time with a reasonable grace period. I wanted, I wanted to go back to that. Who, who can tell me what the industry standard is for payment terms? to wholesale distributors around the US, from, from wholesale distributors back to the wineries. What's, what's the average? 60, 45? 30 to 60, yeah. 30 to 60 is, is, is whatever you can negotiate, whatever I can negotiate with you. You all want 30, you all want tomorrow, but, and I, of course I want six months. Um, so, so let's say it's, it is 30 to 60 days, that's generally accepted. Who can tell me what, well, let me phrase it, let me make sure I phrase this question right, what the average inventory level in days is for domestic wines at most U.S. distributors? In other words, how many days supply do they have on their floor? 15? 30? Really? 90. 90 is the number. That's, that's about average. For all the distributors that I've well, the distributors I've worked for and other distributors I talk to, it's about 90. You real, I, we, I started off with a business plan that said it would be 30, and that's, I can tell you that's impossible. I can tell you 60 is just, is, is just as impossible. You almost average, the average is going to work out to 90. Because unless, you, it's just cutting it too close. So. Keep that in mind. They've got 90 days inventory, and they're paying you in 60. So, so I mean, there, there, there is some give back there. Do you want to define a reasonable grace period? No. I mean, that's, that's <laughs> I'm not going to. That's, that, that's where your relationship with management comes in. And the, the most important thing is your distributor, if, is, is behind, if your distributor is behind in paying you, should not be dodging you. A good distributor will call you and tell you, I'm not going to make my payment that's due on Friday. I'm going to make it in two weeks. And I'm sorry, but that's, th those are my, that's my reality right now. Or for the next three months, I'm going to pay you 15 days late. Wouldn't you rather hear that than pick up the phone and be calling them and not get a call back? 
I mean, I think that's, you, you, you know, that, that, that comes down to your relationship with the distributor. Okay. Hang on. I got lost. Okay, here we go. Okay, we're going to continue on this vein about what a winery should expect from a distributor. A reasonable number of work with, with distributor sales reps. In other words, three a month. I mean, if you can get there. You're, you're not going to go fly from Oregon to Texas uh, three times a month. But if you have a distributor, if you have a marketing rep, or if it's just here in Oregon. Um, you should you should you should get scheduled time at sales meeting because it should be a specific time slot, and you should expect that they remain relatively on schedule. How many of you waited 45 minutes when you were supposed to be on at 10:30 and it's 11:15? Does it happen? Like, I'm, I'm a, I hate that. I'm a stickler for that. We try and run sales meetings within we we figure for within five minutes of our schedule. That's okay. You can't, you know, you get people who get long-winded, you get long-winded winery maker, wine owners who want to talk all the time. So um, you should get an, you should expect an initial rollout with some sort of fanfare, maybe a, you know, um, um, a staff immersion, lunch with key customers, a tasting for customers, an incentive program. Tastings with the sales staff. Sometimes, here's the thing, I, I have wineries come in and, they may come in, we, we used to have two meetings a month, now we have one. They're not coming in when we're having a sales meeting, they're coming in to work the market. They say, gee, can we work, can, we, can you bring all your sales staff together, um, since I'm not at a sales meeting, we'll, we'll taste the, all the new, the new releases. Um, well, that's like, that's pulling salespeople off the street. I actually one day figured out what it costs per hour to have my entire sales staff off the street. The number was huge, it was like, no, we can't do that. We came up with a compromise, and here's a good idea if, if you, you want to share it with people. I said, that's fine. At the end of your work day, at 5.30, we'll do a happy hour. Because the other thing is salespeople don't want to don't give up their whole evening, because they have families and things as well. So we'll do a happy hour. You come in, you, prov you pay for, uh, we'll go into a restaurant, you pay for hors d'oeuvres, not dinner, just hors d'oeuvres. We'll do a restaurant where we can bring the wine. My salespeople come in from 5.30 to 7. That means they can still go home to their families, they're not missing the whole evening. You get an hour and a half of my salespeople. They get a treat because they're at a nice restaurant and they get appetizers and everybody gets to taste the wine. And we're done. And, and that works out. We, we do it. And I'm not taking them off the street because it's after 5.30. Most of their customers don't want to see them at that time anyway. So I mean, that's, that's a nice compromise of something you can do when you want to, you want to do tastings with sales staff that are kind of offline, not, not at a sales meeting. You should expect a responsive management team. You should get calls back. I mean, if, if they don't return your emails or your phone calls within 24 hours, there's something wrong. And a usable website that should have a link to your winery website. I mean, that's the most important thing. They don't have to put everything on your website on theirs, but there should be a link when they go to what at Britain wineries, they, they should click on it, it should bring you to the Britain winery website. Okay, what should a distributor expect from a winery? Accurate FOB pricing. That's not going up and down all the time, and in plenty of time. A respectable gross profit. This is what we talked about before. Depending on where they are, expect that they're going to mark your wine up so that they make a gross profit of between 26 and 32 percent. The example I gave before was a 28 percent gross profit. That's a 39 percent markup. Responsive and accurate order processing. In other words, when they give you an order, that you actually turn it around and get it on the truck heading out. Ellen? Yes. Yes, yes, yes. I think most of us are selling wines over $25 a bottle retail. So we're going to be on the high side of that, right? Yeah. I mean, where it really comes in is, uh, uh, again, I don't, I don't mean to use Kendall Jackson or, uh, for, as an example, but bigger wineries can tell. The, the question was about gross profit and does it vary about the size of the winery. Bigger wineries can use their leverage to say, 
uh, I, you're only gonna make 22% on my brand because my national price has to be this. Generally, the more expensive brands and the more the fine wine houses work on the higher end of this 32%. Um, a 2% sample allowance. And I, I put that in there in some shape, manner, or form, about 2% of samples. And to make your lives easier, I don't recommend billbacks. We don't like to do billbacks because that means I have to hire another person just to do all the sample billbacks for all the wineries, and so do you. What you do is you just say, I'm giving you a 2% discount on every invoice, that's for samples. Meanwhile, don't bill me back for samples. I don't want to see the paperwork. I'm assuming you're using them. Twice a year, give me a sample report that shows how many samples you used. Are we around the 2% range? If not, maybe we renegotiate it, okay? But that's um, one of the things, one of the expectations. And submission to national press publications, that's your job as the winery. Not, not the distributor's job, but you should be doing that, and that helps, that helps as Ellen said before, with the pull-through. Excuse me, Bill. When you talk about 100% samples or 50%? 50%. Yeah, the, the distributor should, sh should share in the cost of samples. Bill, can I grab one more real quick? Yes. Okay. Bill is my distributor. Oh, you weren't and supposed to let that we, out. When we changed distributors, we did a costing of our previous guy and this 2% system. And the 2% system works, and it's less paperwork across my desk and less paperwork for my account. It was a great idea. Yeah. I wish more of our guys had it. By the way, 2%. So the actual okay. samples allowance is 4%. You're each picking in two? Yes. <coughs> it works out generally in the distributor's favor. So they may be kicking in a percent and a half, and you're kicking in two. But you have the right to ask for, let's, let's have an accounting of it. You can talk, you can talk about what you want to do with that, whether if it's, uh, the question was, is that with an established brand or when you're building? Um, generally, if it's a really established brand, no, it can be less. But I hardly deal with anything that's a call item. Uh, and, and we're a fine wine distributor in New York. We have hardly any brands that people just call up and order. Yes? Is it always 50% even when you're making a market visit? Or does it sometimes go to 100%? It, you know what? Whatever you can negotiate. The question is, it always, is it always a 50-50 split samples with your distributor? Whatever you can negotiate, but it should be. There's no reason a distributor shouldn't want to spend, put some of his own money into that that process. Um, oh, here we go. I did move to the next slide. Uh, a usable website with up-to-date PDF cell sheets or text sheets. A marketing plan. You should have a marketing plan. And when I say a marketing plan, it can be as simple as I've got a thousand cases to sell to you in your market. It's in these three SKUs. Here's what the pricing is going to be. We're going to have a discount in the first month when we roll out the new Pinot Gris so that we get everybody on board. Um, I'm going to come to the market in September. I want to do a tasting at this place. And um, I've got this incentive uh, for the month of November. It can be as simple as that. Okay? It doesn't have to be a huge marketing plan, but you should have a plan for each of your markets of what you intend to do, even if it's just pricing, quantity, market visits, um, discounting, et cetera. Market support. You or a winery employee should go to the market at some point. And, it, and we, we don't know what that optimum number is. It depends on the size of your winery. And you should participate in tastings and incentives, both, both physically there and, and, and monetarily. OK, hang on, let me see if we're at the end of this. Uh, you know, one more slide, and then I think we might take a break. Things you should. Hey Bill. Yeah. On your very last point, is it, <laughs> is it reasonable to expect your distributor to set up retail tastings while they're in the market? For instance, after hours at a wine shop with one of their um, with one of their retail 
outlets. Is that a reasonable expectation? Yes. The question is, should distributors be doing retail tastings if they're allowed, and they are allowed in New York, in their stores? Yes. Without your involvement at all. Um, we do them all the time. And, and we actually, it's up to our salespeople. And they look at their business like, uh, and, and the retailers ask them to do it. And if, and if you're, as a salesperson, continually decline to do an in-store tasting, you're generally, your products get pulled off the shelf. So um, it's a very active and aggressive system in, in the New York market of salespeople doing retail tastings because retailers use that resource from us as, as salespeople. All right, I'm going to go. There's a couple of things you should know. There's a couple things. Con control states. There are some states where the state is the distributor. Okay, that's like Pennsylvania, New Hampshire, Utah, Wyoming. There's probably a few others I didn't mention. And there are things you may need to hire an agent or a broker familiar with the state to help you sell. In other words, you, you can easily handle Pennsylvania from the winery. You're, you know, ship them whatever they ask for. But sometimes the, the, the bureaucracy is so Byzantine, there are brokers who specifically, who specialize in control states, and they work with the state agencies, and they can help you navigate all the things you need to know. Pennsylvania is a mystery to me. I was born there, but the, the, their liquor laws are weird. Franchise laws, in case you didn't hear, um, in some states you can't remove a distributor once you appoint them. You can only add others. And we actually tested this in uh, New Jersey a number of years ago. A winery actually pulled out of the, it's a franchise law state. They pulled out of the state and didn't sell for two years because they didn't like their distributor. They came back in and went with another distributor and the state said, doesn't matter. You used to sell to that distributor, you still have to sell to that distributor. So that's, that's what happens. That's what can happen. Yes. Oh, you can. You actually, there is provisions that if if you have a contract and the distributor doesn't fulfill that contract, you can sue them, and you could possibly win. But you'd have to go through the whole lawsuit process and present that to the the state liquor board, the Alcoholic Beverage Commission, and it's. Prove that, I mean, it's, it's so cumbersome and onerous, nobody wants to do that. So yes, there is, you, if you can, or the, the biggest one is if you can prove they didn't pay you. Then you, that's actually the easiest way to get out of a franchise law. If you can prove the distributor owes you money and they haven't paid you and they have no intention of paying you, the state will grant you a waiver. But that's, that's the only instance I know of. Oh yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't. I'll be ready. I'll be ready to go. Okay. All right. So I'm going with wholesale distribution. What are my sales and marketing choices? These are these are some other things you need to add to your strategic plan in, in talking about going for distribution, whether it's just regionally or nationally or picking a few markets. Okay. You're you're always going to need a distributor in every state. In addition, you may need one of the following choices. Um, a national marketing company, a regional marketing company, and this we're going from larger to smaller, forming a marketing alliance with other of your neighboring wineries, pooling your resources, uh, a winery dedicated sales rep, in other words, somebody that you've hired that will be out selling uh, and managing your distributors if you don't have time to do it. Or no, no rep, just you. I mean, all these are possibilities. But somebody, you, somebody has to deal with the billing and the, and the t talking to the distributor and going to visit the market and doing all these, these marketing things that you need to do as a winery. 